Hello, fitness business nerds. What's up? Welcome to another episode of the Business for Unicorns podcast. And today I'm very excited to have literally one of my favorite podcast guests back, back, back again in the house, uh, Dr. John Berardi. How are you, my friend? I'm doing well. It's good to see you. It's good it's to be back. It's so good to see you. So so to see you for our listeners who um, maybe didn't hear our previous conversation or don't know much about you. Uh, most of you, if you've heard of um, John Brady, it's because he's the co-founder of Precision Nutrition, which is one of the largest nutrition coaching companies in the world. Um, and he's also the founder of the Changemaker Academy, which we talked about before on this podcast. We'll probably talk about again. Uh, and I always learn so much from having you on the podcast. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for spending your time with me today. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me back. It's great. I mean, it's been... Uh... I haven't done a lot of interviews lately because I've been, you know, mostly a full time uh, homeschooling parent and <laughs> for the last few years. And so it's, it's nice to use my grown up voice again and uh, talk about business and professional topics. I'm so glad. So I'm so grateful that you decided to do this. So thank you. Thank you. And, um, and I know it's been a while since we connected and between this conversation, and our last has been a whole pandemic. So yeah. let's just start with how the heck are you? How's the family, how you've been holding up through these somewhat crazy times? Pretty good. I mean, I, I, uh, I'm always a little hesitant to extol all the benefits that have accrued in sure. our family over the pandemic because most people have had quite a different experience, but you know, uh, my wife and I are both really passionate about education, and um, we had been entertaining the idea of homeschooling the kids prior to pandemic, and then pandemic came, and l literally the minute it happened, and they were like, ah, we might ha keep kids home from school. We're like, nah, that's all we need to hear. Boom. So it kind of, <laughs> you know, it was like an external pressure pushing us over the edge, which happens a lot in life, right? You, mm -hmm. you, you kick around an idea for quite a long time, and it takes like this little external nudge you know, that, that, that says, uh, whatever you want to call it, the universe prompting you to make a choice. So we've, we've just run with it. So we've been homeschooling for the last several years now. Um, and it's been just so positive, you know, we're home together. And so there, there are times when having six wills, you know, living in the same space full time is challenging. But on balance, it's been really positive. We've gotten to know each other really well. Mm -hmm. um, we've been able to spend a tremendous amount of time learning together and growing together and being a family together and being in community together and learning how to do that in a way that I don't think uh, we would have ever had any other way or, and mm -hmm. many people don't ever have. So that's really been my last several years. It's just been you know figuring out how to live in community with my family in a really positive way that brings us really close together. And so... I've been teaching, I've been coaching all their sports. Uh, and so it's been really, really wonderful, actually. And, um, you know, as a parent or trying to be a good parent or trying to be a good coach or trying to be a good leader at work, you know, you have to listen closely to the needs of, of your team or your family or, mm -hmm. your, you know. And so right now we're starting to feel like maybe one or two of the kids, we have four, uh, might benefit from going back to school. So we're entertaining that idea for the fall. And it's a little bit sad. You know, this has been the saddest part of the pandemic saying, oh, wait, now we may actually return or mm -hmm. someone may return to school. And um, I'm feeling a little bit of a sense of loss over that. But, uh, you know, again, I don't feel sorry for me, anyone, because that <laughs> pandemic has been generally great in, in that capacity <clears throat> for us. Wow. Yeah. What an amazing chapter for you and your family uh, to take a moment, which, you know, had a lot of hardship for a lot of people and in there really find such a beautiful silver lining of spending more quality time together, learning together, learning how to learn together, mm -hmm. <laughs> learning how to be in a different kind of community in your household. Like that's exciting. I'm sure all your lessons learned from leadership in your professional life have come to bear in trying to run a household <laughs> with some systems yeah, and, and yeah. <laughs> for, better, for better or worse, you know, there's some <laughs> things that I long used as a leader of a team of a couple hundred people or as a coach to clients that uh, don't seem to go over well with in the <laughs> family community, right? With We're an like, eight-year-old, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, Socratic questions can get annoying when they are every single day, you know, or uh, some of my other tactics and strategies. Uh, tell me more yeah. about why you feel that way. I yeah. don't want to tell you anymore, Dad. I'm going to be alone <laughs> right now. Okay. 
That's amazing. Well, I'm, maybe there's a future book there at some point <laughs> of lessons learned from uh, homeschooling. It's such a fascinating uh, project to, to take on at homeschooling. And my husband, Andrew, was homeschooled for a little while, and he mm -hmm. shares a lot of, you know, a lot of amazing memories from it and a lot of challenges about it. It's yeah. something I never experienced. So there's probably a lot to talk about there, but I'll, I'll save yeah. that maybe for another podcast. <laughs> yeah, that's great. And, I, and honestly, I feel like um, really as I've gotten older and had a variety of experiences around parenting, coaching, teaching, um, leading mm -hmm. teams, um, I start to come to think of all these things as the same thing. You know, so, I mean, we could mm -hmm. uh, go to the business section and read a book on leadership and then go to the parenting section of the book or library or bookstore or library and read a book on parenting. But um, I think if you really, really are looking for principles on how to live most effectively, there's only one category for this, and it's how to be with people, how to be effectively, yeah. successfully with people. And the same rules apply because um, it doesn't matter that it's a parenting or a coaching or a, a team a work context. Uh, people are people, right? They generally don't being be be they generally don't like being told what to do in specific ways mm -hmm. they generally respond to being asked to do things well in other ways you know and uh this skill of being with people is re really just what i see as the meta skill that people need to develop to navigate the world successfully and i'm so glad it's only one skill like if you develop this one skill then you can port it to every other like I would hate to have to become a master of parenting and separately from a master of coaching, separately from a master of leading teams, separately from a master of mm -hmm. being in relationship with a partner. Uh, gosh, I'd be dead before I could master all those skills. Thankfully, there's only one skill here. It's effectively being with people, right? So yeah, it's, it's, you're, it's so well said. It's so well said, John. And, and the funny thing is, and, um, and this is something I think, you know, you and I have both studied both personally and professionally is right. How to be with people and how to teach people how to be with people, mm -hmm, yes. <laughs> both from like a communication and leadership's perspective, and also just from a level of compassion and empathy. Mm -hmm. right? And what's fascinating is that there, there's no place where everyone learns this mm. aside from we're, we're expected to learn it just by being kind of, a, you know, mirroring monkeys, yeah. <laughs> right? Just by, by learning the norms uh, of the environments that we're brought up in we're working. Uh, and there's no one place where people teach us the real skills. Mm. We often refer to these as the soft skills yeah. right, of being with people. Um, and it's so crucial. Uh, and I think, you know, one of the things I think is a theme in the work I've seen you do, and certainly the work I hope to continue in my life is to make more accessible the lessons and tools people need to better be with people. Yeah. So I think it's so well pointed yeah, out. Yeah, and the, and the mirroring thing is just so fraught, you know what I mean? It, because mm -hmm. uh, if you mirror a context that isn't a positive or effective or successful context, then uh, the tools you think are the ones you're supposed to apply uh, reliably backfire, you know? So it's like, yep. um, yeah, the, the notion of having sort of a place like a clearinghouse for good advice on how to be with people is, is uh, would be so welcome, you know? Seriously. Well, I mean, that brings me back to your book, Changemaker, which I know we talked about on the podcast last, but I would love to circle back to it because um, as we were talking about before we got started recording is, you know, over the last two years of COVID and, um, you know, all sorts of you know, social justice uprising and all kinds of changes in, in, in our country, in, in our countries yeah. and in the world. Um, I wonder if we, if we would, if we, if you look at your change maker material any differently now. So for those of you who are not familiar, change maker was a book you put out and what, what year did it come out? Uh, so the book came out in 2019. 2019. Yeah, that's so right. And, I, and it was about helping health and fitness professionals kind of align their purpose and their career to do great work. Mm -hmm. And obviously during COVID, one of the things that happened was this kind of great resignation where everyone in this pause we had took a moment to reflect and reconsider whether or not there was alignment mm -hmm. of their purpose and their career. And so in some ways, your book was very predictive of, of what was going to be happening in everyone's lives. Yeah. And it was great timing. And so I'm wondering, I'm wondering how you think about your approach to that challenge in the book th these few years later. Yeah, it's a, it was actually interesting because the genesis for the book was I had ended up selling my ownership of Precision Nutrition um, in 2017. And I didn't know what I was going to do next. Um, you know, I wanted to leave open the possibility of 
maybe never working in health and fitness again, or maybe working it again. I, I don't know, but I didn't want the momentum of my life to just continue me in the same direction without some kind of thoughtful reflection on maybe what I might want. And the fact that we have, and at the time they were a couple of years younger, four young children, um, it just gave me the opportunity to say, well, wait, okay, I sold my company. I, I could retire. I could spend all my time with them, or I could start a new business, or I could, you know, there's uh, sort of a whole menu of options and opportunities now. And what I wanted to do first was, you know, typically if you sell your company, people aren't going to be like, oh, yeah, buy, I'd like to buy your company that you started and you're the spokesperson for, and I want you to disappear and go away. That's not how it works, right? <laughs> they, they want you to stay much more than you, you want to, and they want you to contribute much more than maybe you're uh, prepared to. And uh, so there's about a year of transition, bringing on a new leadership team and all that sort of a thing. And while I did that, um, I sort of ramped up this desire to share everything I think I've learned about working in health and fitness, growing a very successful business in the field, about coaching, about developing yourself and your career and your education plan and all those kind of things. So in other words, if you were going to build tomorrow's you, uh, how would you do that thoughtfully? How would you do that in a way that increases the probability of success, right? Build the curriculum to future you, right? So that's what the book is about. How do you go out, figure out if you should be in health and fitness at all? If so, where within it, like what roles and responsibilities or jobs should you take? Um, and then how do you engineer a high probability of success in that particular path? And so, uh, I was just like, it was so fresh in my mind. Uh, I have the time now. So you think about you know, like the minute you sell the company, you're still at 100% within the company. But over the course of a year, that diminishes. So you've got a diminishing curve down to like 10% or 0% a year later. And while that curve is diminishing, my writing book curve is increasing. So, so I released <laughs> the book, uh, comes out in 2019 does very well as it comes out of the gate, but health and fitness is still a niche market. You know, it, it wasn't mm -hmm. going to sell 10 million copies ever. It's a career book for health and fitness professionals, which is exactly what I wanted it to be. But then two years later in 2021, it ended up winning career book of the year in this prestigious Axiom Book Awards thing, which I didn't even submit it for. Our publisher did. And I, I got a medal <laughs> in the mail and I said, what's this? And they were like, oh, you won. <laughs> and it, it's really interesting because that came right in the heart of the pandemic, right? So yep, it's exactly um, what, whether it was being recognized as being a little prescient or whether it was, you know, just the right thing at the right time, right? The idea of considering like, hey, you know, the pandemic, like very much like two, two, three years prior, I had this, you know, whatever fork in the road saying like, hey, sold your company, you can continue to try and do stuff in health and fitness, or maybe take a minute. So I sort of had this external force, as we talked about earlier, to like knock yep. me out of the familiar comfort groove routine. Um, and uh, I think a lot of people had that with the pandemic, right? I mean, certainly, th there was an external pressure for a lot of people working as, let's say, trainers who couldn't go to work and couldn't earn an income, mm -hmm. right? But then there were also these other areas that were less black and white, they were very gray in terms of like, well, wait a second, there's a value shift here. You know, there's an opportunity to say, wake up from the dream or nightmare and evaluate <laughs> what I might like to do next. And that's really the core question at the heart of the Changemaker book and my subsequent work is, um, who are you? Who are the people out there that, you know, need you to help serve them and how do you align those two things so that it fits in with your unique abilities your sense of purpose your value system and rather than accidentally stumbling upon it how do you intentionally create that not alone with the help of friends family colleagues who can mm -hmm. see your life from slightly different perspectives than you can so if we team up, right, and there's a, you, you've seen the book, you, there's exercises in mm -hmm. there for this. If me and the people close to me team up, we could actually come up with a thing that really represents who am I? What are my unique abilities? When I do these things, they make a difference and they make me feel great. Well, shoot, I, I want to do more of that, right? And then mm -hmm. um, where's my value set? How do I 
put like a set of parameters around that. And then what, what is my purpose? You know, we hear lots of things about purpose in popular media and in books and things like that. But, you know, for me, it, it really is boiled down to this, like stuff has happened to you in your life. That stuff has given you like a, an emotional response to certain things that you like and certain things that you don't like. Your purpose is functionally all the stuff, good, bad, neutral, that's happened to you, that's brought you to where you are today, and what you feel gives you meaning as a result of that. You know, I, I don't think we're reaching out into the great cosmos and picking a purpose out of the ether. You know, I really think mm -hmm. it's, you know, it, maybe you've had some terrible childhood experiences and that has shaped your sense of purpose. Maybe you've had some wonderful ones. It's probably a combination of the two and a bunch of neutral ones as well. And a bunch of random people that you accidentally stumbled across or random activities and events or, you know, mm -hmm. extracurricular activities, you know, and all of a sudden, I don't know, just some particular thing or things feel resonant. They give you butterflies or tingles or they make you feel taller or bigger chested, you know what I mean? Like full of energy yeah. and vigor. And that is the purpose thing, you know what I mean? And so how do we just take that purpose, unique abilities and values and look at life differently now and sort of come up with a plan for living in accordance with those and then looking at the world, so that's you, right? Now looking at the world and saying, okay, where are the places I can use those things? And so that's, uh, that's yeah. really what the book started out as. And then as a jumping off point from that, some uh, young people contacted me and said, oh, there should be, like, there should be a business around this. We, there should be courses. We should teach people <laughs> how to do this all the way, right? And so, um, you know, so we started the Changemaker Academy for that reason and, you know, Full disclosure, I only spend a couple hours a month on that project because my number mm -hmm. one is family. Uh, but I have a great team and, and I talk to them, make sure they're on the right track. And, uh, and they're out there, you know, connecting with people on a regular basis, helping them do this work and, and some other cool stuff too. I mean, since we last talked, one of the things that we've gotten off the ground is um, what we're calling Caliper for health and fitness. So in my book, I talked about this company that does psychometric profiling. So most mm -hmm. people have done this to some degree um, where you answer a bunch of weird questions. Sometimes they're math or puzzles. And sometimes there are questions like, you know, about how you like to be with other people or how you like to do your work. And uh, these psychometric tests tell you something about yourself. So Caliper is the most sort of research validated one we'd ever found. And we mm -hmm. gave it to all of our new teammates and possible recruits at Precision Nutrition. We used it to figure out how to work together effectively and to understand ourselves better. And I was consistently, I guess, annoyed or disappointed or whatever, that there was no such thing for health and fitness fields. I mean, you could find a profile for the ideal HR candidate, for the ideal nurse, for the ideal finance person for the ideal internet marketer but there wasn't a single category for health and fitness wow and so i was like well i don't know let's go make one <laughs> so we partnered with caliper we surveyed about fifteen thousand health and fitness professionals we asked them all kinds of demographics questions what their education level was what their earnings were we had them self-rate uh, themselves as professionals we had them come up with sort of we, there were questions that got at sort of satisfaction in the field and competency in the field and things like that and success measures and then we had them do the caliper and we are finding relationships between these sort of core traits that caliper assesses and whether that you know indicates you'd be successful as a in-person personal trainer online coach in-person dietitian and on down the line within health and fitness so that's been a really cool project because now we can say like all right do this work to figure out who you are and your unique abilities and all that and now we there's actually a an assessment that you can take mm -hmm. and it'll tell you which subdomain of health and fitness or that, that you might have a high probability of being successful in or whether you should be in the field at all sure so that's been a that's a so cool, impressive cool yeah development for sure and one of the things i'm most impressed by is Typically, uh, Caliper to begin sort of a, you know, career related um, 
assessment, right? So HR, finance, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, their benchmark for a beginning data set was like 500 people surveyed. And I was like, that's not enough. You know, so no. we're going to go out and get That's amazing. You got 15,000. That's you know incredible. I mean? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. so that's been a, a really cool thing that uh, uh, you can't buy right yeah. now. You know, we are, we, it's mm -hmm. in the very early stages. My dream was to make sure everyone can get it for free. Uh, I don't know sure. if the uh, people who run the businesses around this thing or <laughs> share that dream, <laughs> but, uh, but it's a good starting yeah, exactly. place. Well, what, what's what I love about it so much, Sean, is that, is that, you know, as we both know, fitness and nutrition and wellness and its current iteration is such a young industry. Yeah. We know so little about ourselves mm -hmm. and we especially know so little from any real kind of rigorous research perspective, yeah. right? And so having a real rigorous approach to studying ourselves, what makes us successful in certain roles in industry is so powerful and valuable. And um, yeah, I hope, I hope that that project continues and we yeah. can seize the day I of, mean, there's the light of day for everyone one, because it's One example that just crucial. jumped to mind is um, one of the individuals who used to run the uh, training arm of Precision Nutrition. Mm -hmm. So all the strength and conditioning programs and all the exercise programs and all that is a guy named Craig Weller. And Craig uh, used to be a special operations forces um, person in the military, in the, in the Navy. And, um, you know, he used to share with me how assessment happens for different sub branches of special operations. People have heard of the Navy SEALs most famously, but other special operations groups, uh, they essentially have done this exact process, right? So they've assessed mm -hmm. candidates who've been successful as a SEAL or as uh, what Craig was in, SWCC, Special Warfare Combat Crewman. And there's all these other branches, right? Uh, Green Berets. And, and so they've assessed them. And then when candidates want to try for special operations selection, um, they kind of know what the ideal profile is based on just some questions. You know, they're like, oh, this type of person would be great as a Green Beret, but not as a SEAL. This type of person would maybe not be great in special operations, even though they may have the physical capabilities we know from sure. how they like to organize their time, how they respond to authority, all these kinds of things where they might fit best and where they might not. And again, it happens everywhere. And it's how high performers are screened and selected everywhere. I mean, when mm -hmm. I first heard about the caliper, it was in a printed newspaper. So we know how long ago that was in Toronto. <laughs> and uh, I read about how they were using this tool to screen draft picks for the Toronto Raptors. So NBA mm -hmm. basketball. And um, at that level where you're selecting a top round draft pick, they're all talented guys, right? Of and course. we know all their stats. But if we can assess the psychometric profiles of the team, the current team, and we can assess the candidates, we can figure out who might best plug into the team, right? In a mm -hmm. team perspective. So I was yeah, just- Exactly. You know, and I was just struck uh, by, yeah, it's sorry. just yeah. used everywhere, right? And in health and exactly. business- Exactly, I was gonna say, this is such a norm in every other yeah. industry, right? You can't, no one's been able to get a, a job in any sort of C-suite and of any, of any business <laughs> for the, for the last 10, 15 years without taking some psychometric assessment. Yeah. And in fitness, we've had just had the, haven't had the data yeah. to say, what makes a good trainer? How do I, how do I, you know, under, better understand my team to find the next hire. And so the fact that that could be on the horizon, um, is such an amazing contribution. So, you, you know, you're, you and your team get a big standing ovation from me. So thank yeah, you. Thanks. Hi, it's Mark. Super brief break in the action to remind you to subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. If you enjoy this podcast, this is super helpful for us. It helps spread the word so we can spend even more time and more resources creating the best possible fitness business podcast in all the land. Now back to the show. Yeah. Um, I want to just go back and just just reiterate something you said earlier, because um, for those listeners who haven't gotten Changemaker book yet, um, you, you know, you obviously gave a wonderful description of what's in there. But one of the things I just want to say that I love so much about your approach and the, even the way you described on this podcast is that the Changemaker approach is not just kind of like an intellectual 
do this thinking in your head kind of process, yeah. right? And so often when people think about aligning their purpose and their career, they think about like all the work has to happen in their head. And the thing I love about the process, and you described it this way, is no, you actually want to lean on the people around you. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's both a relational process where you're going to ask people around you how they see you and think about you and perceive you. It's also a, kind of an embodied process. You talked about the stimulus in your life, the things in your life and how it makes you feel. Mm -hmm. It makes you feel puffed up or excited excited, right? You talk about these things in the book as a way of like, this is all data you bring to the table. Yeah. All data from outside people, from all different data you get from your own body and your physical experience. And that is part of what informs understanding your purpose. That is part of what informs what, you know, the kind of career you might have. And the fact that that kind of thinking is going to be embodied in this new research is also spectacular. Mm -hmm. The question I want to ask you though about that, this is why I'm circling back, and this relates to what you were just talking about as well, is one of the challenges I see with a lot of business owners that I work mm -hmm. with on a regular basis is they might be really great at understanding and defining their, their purpose and aligning that with their career at, let's just say the start of opening their gym. Yeah. And then what happens is five years later, 10 years later or more, there's a tension mm. between what they thought their identity and their purpose was and what their career has become. Mm. And th that tension sometimes is hard to resolve because they're not, they're uncomfortable with the idea that their purpose has to change mm. or can change, or they're uncomfortable with the idea of having to rethink their career. So it's not the doing it once part. It's the part I love to hear you talk about is having this be an evolving process, mm. right? Cause you've been, you've done this so beautifully, mm, right? Yeah. The reason you made this book is because you were changing your purpose and your career in, in many yeah. ways. And so I'm curious if you could just talk a little bit about like the kind of iterative nature of one's purpose and how that aligns with sometimes, especially now these days, people don't stay in careers for decades anymore. So you can just maybe talk about how this changes and evolves, evolves over yeah. time. I want to both kind of normalize it for our listeners yeah. and also kind of hear it from your perspective. Well, I'll, I'll start with the story that I told in the book, you know, at, at the height of our success at Precision Nutrition, you know, it was, it was really starting to fly. You know, we were, mm -hmm. we were making a big impact in the industry uh, financially. It was like we were printing money. Um, I was in this position personally where I would go places and people would know who I was and recognize me and tell me very positive, nice things. And, um, <laughs> and so like, you know, the work that I did made me feel great. But when I went to my computer on Monday morning, I felt horrible. Um, mm. And this went on for a really long time. And again, I talk about in the book, like I, I was at a stage where, you know, I keep all these notes all the time, journals, notebooks, whatever. And I, I was writing about how uncomfortable I was, how I wasn't doing my unique ability work, how I wasn't, and this was before I discovered all the exercises that I, I share in the book. I wasn't living to my purpose, using my unique abilities to my values. And, and I felt really, really stuck. You know, we had just had our mm. third child. I'm at this company that anyone in the field would be envious to be at, let alone running. And I was sad all the time, depressed. And um, I couldn't see a clear way out of it. And I was doing the exact problem you talked about. I was trying to figure out alone in my own mm -hmm. head, um, which is such a problem because we live and work in community. Like how, how could you possibly yeah. then figure out how to be in community alone in your own head, right? And, exactly. and then I wrote down a list of ways to get out, you know, uh, one way was to sell my shares of the company, you know, and as the list went on, some of the bottom options were kill myself. And mm. it was a sobering list. I still have it. And it goes to show, and as you said, sort of normalize the idea that even people who you look at who seem to be crushing it could be struggling in, in very might feel strange ways. You know, again, I was in mm -hmm. a position that almost anyone in the field would be envious of, um, financially successful, lots of respect from my team and from, from the industry at large, doing great things. You know, we were helping people change and helping professionals grow and everything was positive except I wasn't enjoying my work. And that's when it became clear I need to do something part of the process was doing this exact unique abilities work. So please, for anyone listening, this isn't just for people new to the field. My God, it's, 
so, some I you, at that point you would say I was mm -hmm. the exact opposite of new. I was a veteran in the field, yeah. right? And I needed to yep. do it myself. Um, so you know, as you talk about the story of the gym owner who's five, ten years in and and feeling the feelings, you know. Uh, so now the, the the first explanation for that is um, your role has evolved past the point of what you once did. Right. I mean, for me, what I uncovered was I wasn't doing any of the things that I started out doing and I started out doing them because I enjoyed them. That's why I started my own thing. I was like, oh, I'll start my own company so I can do the things that I enjoy. Right. And yep. I was now doing none of the things that I enjoyed, you know, none of the things I was good at. I felt like I had to be a C something. O when really I just like writing, teaching, doing research. <laughs> Can I interrupt for a second, John? Because I just want to say what's what I love about this. What you're saying so much is that it's so true, and I'm, I'm bad. Imagine people are going to be listening to this and nodding their heads, and it's so counterproductive, even to advice I've given, which which I think is still also true at the same right. time. Which is when you're building a business, part of your job is to always be replacing yourself. Right. Right. You want to grow and scale a brick and mortar gym, which most of our listeners are owners of, right? You have to go from being the cleaner to not being yeah. the cleaner, from being the front desk person to not being, right? And at a certain level, you if you do that right, you're absolutely not doing the things you did in year right. one. And if you started your business because you loved what you're doing in year one, that's a problem. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's it, right? So I think there's beautiful nuance there because it, the advice yeah. is not to become a cease. It, it isn't don't become a see something oh right maybe that's what mm -hmm. your unique abilities will lead you right towards and that would be wonderful yep. um but the advice is know yourself know the needs of the people in the business and all that and then align it right i mean ultimately what i decided was I, i'm going to make a list of all the things that i'm doing right now uh and all the things that i wish i was doing <laughs> You know, and there's like uh -huh. a quadrant system that the unique abilities process helps you do. So the things that you're good at and make a difference when you do them, the things that you're good at and don't enjoy make no difference and, and on down the list, right? To uh, mm -hmm. you're not good at make no difference and you hate, right? That's another quadrant. And you start filling these things out and you go, oh, wait, okay, cool. I can see a way out of this now. What I need to mm -hmm. do is more of the things that are in my unique abilities quadrant and then find people to do the other things, right? So like you said, maybe you find your sweet spot at year two of your gym or year three, or maybe it was year sure. one or whatever, <laughs> right? But it's uh, don't allow yourself to graduate out of the thing that when you do it, you have a blast at doing, that when you do mm -hmm. it, it makes a difference. It, whatever your metrics of meaning are, grows your business, grows your team, makes you more money, whatever it is. Don't graduate out of those things, right? You can always hire an executive, and allow yourself to stay in that space of competence and joy and all that. So to, you know, I think there's the two poles, right? One is uh, get stuck in what you love, right? Which mm -hmm. that may be fun unless that prevents you from paying the bills and growing your thing to the point where it needs to grow. Uh, and sure. the other thing is don't graduate yourself uh, out of what you love, right? Um, there's something in between there, which is, you know, grow the thing, figure out what the needs are, maybe hire around your, your incompetencies uh, and stay mm -hmm. in your competencies as long as they're doing the thing. They're what you, again, unique abilities as we define them are the thing that you're world-class or can be, the thing that brings you joy and you can see yourself doing it for a really long time and always wanting to learn more about it. And then it makes a difference on your metrics of meaning. If you can find that in your business, well, I mean, what a great place to be. Even better, now extracting out from, again, this solo in your own head approach, put the other people in your business in the same position, right? So yep. now you have a yep. bunch of people working in their unique abilities, what they love, what they're good at. It makes a difference when they do that. Now when you're elbow to elbow with 10 or 15, or in, in my case, 150 at, at a certain time at PN, elbow to elbow with those kind of people, people talk about culture, good corporate culture and stuff. I mean, this is the core of good corporate culture. I mean, you can come up with position statements and all that, but how about everyone here absolutely loves what they're doing, wants to get better at it all the time, and when they do it, it makes a difference with helping out every person next to them along the way. I mean, that's culture right there, right? So, I mean, we're, these feel like a little sidebars from the original question, but the idea here is just you know, talking about unique abilities, talking about values, talking about purpose, you have to keep redoing it. 
you have to keep going mm -hmm. over and over again because theoretical gym owner who we've all met, you know, who's five years in, 10 years in is sad, is uh, getting jaded about the industry is, you know, again, runs a successful gym. They meet with the people that they're helping all the time and they get a little infusion of joy and, and satisfaction. But on balance, when they're alone at home, they're sad. They're sad that they have this business and they're not quite sure why. And they're like, if I told anyone about this, they would think I'm an asshole because mm -hmm. externally it looks like we're doing great. Like, how come I can't just make myself happy and be grateful for the things yep. I have? I mean, I've seen this so many times as you have, and I've lived it too. And, you know, part of it is, again, uh, you've maybe graduated yourself out of the things you enjoy. And the other part of it is you've evolved, right? Maybe you don't enjoy mm -hmm. the same things anymore. So there could be two quite distinct explanations for that feeling. And to me, the solution is continuing to check in with yourself in these ways. You know, I used to talk about this in my marriage. Again, I, I use, I, I leave professional examples all the time and I go to personal examples and coaching examples because it, this is all the same skill set. You know, um, during the time when all four of our children were very young, there wasn't lots of time. We didn't have a nanny or anything like that for us to connect, my wife and I mm -hmm. often, and spend that like high volume of time together that may be required for all the positive things that you expect to come from relationships. But I felt like if we could just check in on some interval, like once a week, just like, and it, it didn't have to be like a big date or anything, just how are you? What's going on in your mind? I haven't seen you for a week. I don't know what you're thinking about. I, I mm -hmm. in some ways, you know, if we believe people are changing all the time and, you know, as the Buddhists and Eastern thinkers have, long said there maybe isn't even such a thing as a fixed self if we believe some of those yep. things you know i don't know who you are since last <laughs> week you know what i mean yeah i, I have assumptions yep. about who you are since before you know but i don't know so let me check in i think the same has to be true for your own self and so i think in the beginning of your career it's it's a more frequent check-in process and later on it could be an annual thing or whatever but you just go ahead and gather the people and yourself and redo the values, purpose, unique abilities thing every year and try not to cling to uh, steadfast to the answers of the past and figure out what they are now, right? And that, that may lead to some uncomfortable, you know, sort of outcomes, right? Where you're like, oh man, I'm in a position now, but at least you'll understand who you are. And mm -hmm. when you do that, you'll also see some clear pathways forward. Yeah. Well said, my friend. I think it's a, it's a great way to end the episode. In fact, yeah. <laughs> I think it's great advice because I think, you know, we are uh, always changing and growing and evolving as are the people around us. So the idea that you're only going to have one purpose forever and always, or one career path forever and always, um, is, uh, is mostly a myth. Mm. It's mostly a myth, maybe true for a small percentage. So I love the idea that you just kind of revisit, yeah. you know, your values and your purpose and your unique abilities on a regular basis to relearn about yourself reconnect yeah. with yourself and I, I also think your point about doing that for the teams you manage the teams you lead that is a definition of a great war culture mm -hmm. right right <laughs> that's a great yeah. vision you painted there so thank you for yeah. that for our listeners who want to learn more obviously you can go get the change maker book yeah. um, but where can they learn more about the great work your team's doing at change maker academy right now how can they follow you on the interwebs when you're on the interwebs yeah, yeah. i mean I, uh, i'm mostly yeah. how do they get more john yeah, berardi i'm mostly figuring out a way to get off the interwebs but i do have a website johnberardi.com yeah. where people can come by and uh, read about all great. the things that i'm i've done or i'm involved in and they can jump off from there to see precision nutrition stuff or see change maker stuff and all that um and I, and I love for people to, to get the book, actually. You know, I mean, if you work yeah. in health and fitness and you uh, haven't had a chance to access it, I, I think that it'll make a difference. You know, it's probably $15 on Amazon right now, and it essentially encapsulates everything I've learned in, geez, 
almost 30 years in the field now, maybe over 30 years now. I think I've stopped counting. Um, and- <laughs> it's amazing. When, we, when it first came out, we gave it to all of our Unicorn Society members. It's practical and tactical and, um, and just such a valuable tool to have on your bookshelf because you're going to come back to it, as you said, like once a year mm. or more. To, and you'll share it with team members and friends who are also curious about their purpose. And while the language you speak in it is a little geared towards health and fitness, I would also say it's a great roadmap for anyone rethinking their purpose and unique abilities and values. So I think, you know, I think share away my friends because it's a fantastic tool. I've already been through it twice. Well, thanks. Thanks for that. Thanks for sharing that with folks. And yeah, uh, thanks for everyone for listening today. Yeah. Thanks for being here. Uh, it's always a pleasure. It's always, um, so exciting to hear what you're up to next. You're always so great at, at creating the next chapter for yourself of where you want to have an impact. I know there's a million more topics we could talk yeah. about. Um, but I just really appreciate the time that we had together today. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dear listeners, if you found this valuable, please share it leave a review and shoot me an email. Let me know if there's any other one, anyone else you want me to talk to, uh, any other topics you want us to cover. Michael at businessforunicorns.com is my email. Once again, thank you, John. Have a great rest of your day and listeners, I'll see you on the next one. Thanks everyone. friends, it's me again. Just a quick reminder that our coaching conversations course is coming up. It's a two-day live workshop on Zoom, Friday, October 14th, Saturday, October 15th, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern. You can register at businessforunicorns.com forward slash coaching conversations. If you have any questions at all about the course, just email me, michael at businessforunicorns.com. Hope to see you there.